Hello, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to meet you. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, the organizers of the Open World Forum for having me here. Uh, also, to our friends at Epril, uh, who helped make me trip, helped me make the trip to Paris. And I want to apologize, first of all, for, for not speaking French. Um, you know, next time, I hope. Uh, but uh, this time, it has to be in English, which, unfortunately, is just about the only language I know. Shameful. Um, I've been the executive director at the Free Software Foundation since uh, 2011, but I've been with the FSF since 2003. So just over 10 years now. Um, as was mentioned, that's about one-third of what the GNU Project just celebrated this past weekend. The FSF itself was founded as a nonprofit organization in 1985 to fight for the freedoms of computer users worldwide uh, and to sponsor the GNU Project, um, which, of course, has the goal of making a fully free operating system. So I want to wish GNU a, another, a very happy birthday. Uh, the initial announcement of the GNU system by Richard Stallman was made uh, last week, Friday, 30 years ago, in 1983. Um, it was great to have the event uh, celebrated. We had a celebration, a related event that occurred on every continent, every inhabited continent, I should say, not Antarctica. Um, and we had a very nice celebration here in Paris um, that Richard Stallman was uh, present at, um, was sponsored by April. So, and hosted by them. So uh, I want to thank them very much for doing that. And I hope everybody noticed the awesome artwork on the staircase coming into the building here. We have a nice GNU um, draped down the stairs and also a little GNU blowing out a birthday candle. And that's, I wish we would have thought of that for our own event. That was a very nice thing to walk into today. So at the FSF and the GNU project, um, we have a, a goal which is not what some people think it is. Our goal is to have all computer users be able to do everything they need to do on any computer using only free software. And this is the goal that we've been working toward since it was first announced in 1983. Um, now, I haven't been working on this since 1983. In 1983, I was playing with little action figures and lip syncing to bad American pop music. Uh, but that's when Richard Stallman and the GNU Project began their work. So. As part of this, in order to actually be the change that we want to see in the world, uh, the FSF has a very strong policy as an organization of only using free software and free formats. We also, as part of that policy, encourage everybody that we work with um, outside the organization, and sometimes we require them um, to use only free software, free formats, and free fonts. And you know, we believe in doing our best to live up to our own ideals. So this applies to document editing, accounting, voice communication. We host our own email. We don't use Amazon S3. Um, and a lot of people are surprised by this when they find out about it. And I can see why. It's a very unusual thing for an organization to do, even organizations that are otherwise committed to a mission of, in some form or another, promoting free software. Now, this mission, this rule policy can be very difficult. You know, uh, I routinely have to ask people that have no idea about these issues to resend their work in a free format. So when working with immigration lawyers, I have to ask them to resend their document as a free format instead of as a Microsoft Word attachment. Uh, and you know, it's why my slides are in PDF and not PowerPoint. Uh, but I find still, every time that that's a useful interaction, it may bewilder some people at first. But if that's the first time that they've heard of the issue of free software and how it pertains to formats and communication, you know, all the better. So even while it's an inconvenience, I think it does end up working toward our organization's mission. And communication, of course, is a particular issue in this area because our work uh, is international. We want to protect the freedoms of people all around the globe, not just in the United States. And if we're going to avoid some atrociously large phone bills, uh, we need some form of communication where we can interact with people um, that doesn't cost either us or them a fortune. So we're often asked to use Skype for this. And that often leads to the question after I say no, what do you mean you can't Skype? I hear this question multiple times per week these days, which is part of why I wanted to make it um, the sort of case study topic here in this presentation. Well, the answer, of course, is that we could Skype, um, but we won't. And that's because Skype is not free software. And I'm going to spend a minute on this here because I, I think it's something that's commonly misunderstood. What do you mean Skype isn't free software? You can download it for free. You can install it on just about any operating system. So what do we mean by free software? 
Well, free software entails four freedoms. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program for any purpose. Freedom one, the freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does your computing as you wish. Freedom two, the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help out your neighbor. Three, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. By doing this, you can give the whole community a chance to benefit from your changes, unless it's my code, uh, in which case you can give the whole community a chance to share your bugs. But either way, it is a fundamental freedom that needs to be protected. So there are several ways that software can be made proprietary. It can happen through the copyright license, uh, which is one of the most common areas we look at. It can happen through the end user licensing agreement contract. It can happen through software patents. Um, and the GNU general public license, the preamble, um, states the, the context that we're in best. It says the licenses for most software and other practical works are designed to take away your freedom to share and change the works. And by contrast, the GPL is intended to guarantee your freedom to change and share all versions of a program to make sure it remains free software for all users. So Skype's license makes it not free software. We can start with freedom zero. Uh, while you can't download the program without charge, Skype denies you the freedom to run the program for any purpose. This uh, lovely quote from the license uh, puts a restriction that you're not allowed to run the program for commercial purposes, i.e. making money. Arguably, this applies to a nonprofit when it wants to do something like raise funds. So, and Skype is wishy-washy about this. There's another bit of their license which says that it's okay to install it in your own business, on your uh, personnel's computers. It's unclear. But the bottom line is that they claim the authority through their copyright license and through their uh, end-user licensing agreement to regulate the way that you can run the computer, run the machine, run the program, even when it's on your own computer and your own machine. Skype is also uh, not consistent with freedom one. It denies you the freedom to read and modify the program's source code. You may not, and you agree not to, undertake, cause, permit, or authorize the modification, creation of derivative works, or improvements. Don't you dare improve our software. <laughs> that is forbidden. It also is not consistent with freedoms two and three. You're not allowed to share modified or unmodified versions of the program with other people. Although anybody can download the software, at no charge for non-commercial use from Skype's website, uh, you are not allowed to give a copy of that same program to somebody else sitting right next to you. This is because Skype and Microsoft want to retain control over how the software is distributed. But of course, there's a lot of proprietary programs out there. So why am I picking on Skype? Is it because it's owned by Microsoft? Nope. Uh, when Microsoft first bought Skype, um, Richard Solomon said, the Skype client program is non-free software. It gives its owner power over its users. Presently, it will give the same power to a different company. The identity of the master is just a detail because freedom means not having a master at all. Now, the reason that I am focusing on Skype is because uh, Skype is an example of the most dangerous kind of proprietary software for the free software movement. It does not cost any money. Of course, it's much easier to argue against very expensive proprietary programs. It works very well. It's much easier to argue against Windows. It leverages a network effect. To talk to someone using Skype, you also have to install Skype. It runs on otherwise free operating systems like GNU Linux. So you can have cases where it's one of the only or few proprietary programs that a person who is otherwise uh, tailoring most of their computing around free software will still have installed on their system. So that's why, not because of Microsoft. But also, the very essence of the free software movement is collaboration and communication. Many other kinds of movements in journalism, in political decision making, in uh, culture, all of these areas are focusing on the lessons learned from the incredible grassroots, broad-based kind of organization we've had such success with in the free software movement. Um, it's what's, you know, the way free software development, free software advocacy have mature, has matured and came about depended on effective collaboration over widespread distances between different languages and systems. But now, with Skype, our best thing is becoming our worst thing. Skype is software to do an incredibly important job, communication, you know, conversations that you have with your friends, your colleagues, uh, your loved ones, um, and in the free software movement, conversations you have with fellow developers or fellow free software users. If we don't control that infrastructure, the thing to do what we are supposed to be best at, collaborate, then what do we control? What are we doing to that example that was such a shining achievement of the free software movement? 
we're showing that we need proprietary software in order to conduct the most fundamental business uh, of the free software movement. But even more than that, it's going to come back and bite us. So much like PayPal has had an unfortunate track record of turning off funding for projects that have become politically controversial in the eyes of particularly powerful groups, you have to envision that Skype and Microsoft can employ the same kind of control, and it is simply not safe for the free software movement or for any advocacy organization or for any business to depend on Skype. And this isn't just a hypothetical. I mean, at the Free Software Foundation, we always try to remind people that you should not wait for the proprietary software to abuse you before you switch to something else. But software like Skype already is accumulating a track record of uh, abusing its users and of inappropriately exercising the control that the proprietary nature of the software gives them over those users. Skype gave personal info about a WikiLeaks supporter to another company with no legal obligation to do so. Skype messages are not encrypted in the end, and Microsoft can read them. Uh, Skype, of course, has been wrapped up in the NSA revelations in the United States. And Microsoft does read those messages. You'll find denials about this in the media, and if you scrutinize them very carefully, you'll see that they're not actually denying uh, that bottom line claim. So to recap, when you use Skype, you help create a norm that Skype usage and proprietary software usage in general is OK. You put your communications and the communications of your organization at the mercy of a company that does not have your interests in mind and has a track record of, in fact, betraying your interests. And you contaminate one of the shining values of the free software movement, not just open communication uh, that can be done without cost, but actual free communication where the users who are doing the communicating also have control over the software. And it's simply not worth it. Uh, you shouldn't be deceived even by the price because Skype is not actually free. There are costs associated with using Skype. Your costs are your individual freedom, the freedom of the other people that are pressured or enticed to use Skype by the fact that you are also using it and communicating successfully with it, the autonomy of your organizations, uh, and everybody's privacy. And those temporary gains in efficiency we might get um, communication because Skype works really well is just not worth these costs. And it's not worth the cost of undermining the ethical commitment to free software. Of course, it's not just Skype. Um, I'm doing this partly as an example to demonstrate issues with all proprietary software, but even in the area of communication, we have other things to worry about. Uh, everything I've said can also be said about uh, Google Hangouts, can also be said about FaceTime, or any other proprietary software that's used in the course of free software development and communication. Uh, Google Hangouts, which require patented formats and a, either a proprietary plugin or proprietary JavaScript, are a major problem. I see many people who consider themselves free software activists and who are doing a lot of good work on behalf of the free software movement uh, using Google Hangouts for coordination and making the case here that I, I hope they will stop that and instead help us improve the free solution. So the question is, if we don't have Skype, how do we communicate? So at the FSF, we don't use Skype. We use the free software phone server Asterisk uh, and SIP which is a standard protocol that's spoken by many clients for doing video and audio communication. Uh, and you can, there's many programs out there that speak this protocol or do something similar to Skype. I have a few of them listed here, but uh, Mumble, which does voice and is very actually reliable. Uh, Jitsi, which does voice and video and is definitely still under active development, but I have had successful video calls across different operating systems using it. Um, so development seems to be progressing very well. WebRTC is a, a new alternative that's come into the space. It has a lot of promise. In the GNU project, we have our own GNU Telephony, which does voice and video and has a high emphasis on decentralization and encryption. Uh, Pigeon with uh, Jabber XMPP to cover the case of just the Skype uh, instant messages. And Asterisk, which for an organization is a, an especially nice piece of software um, to organize your phone system. So a key thing you'll see about all these technologies is that they use standardized protocols. And I think we need to keep in mind it's important that we establish a network effect, not behind individual programs necessarily, but behind a protocol that could be implemented by any program. Although, of course, an individual free program that uh, could work as well as Skype would be a huge improvement over the situation, even if it didn't use a standard protocol. But of course, people will say they need Skype. Well, you, you probably don't need it uh, in, at the, in, the, in the end. I mean, we've gotten along for quite a while without it. But, I'm going to say this very nicely, but if you're using Skype, part of what you're doing, that part of what you're doing is hurting the free software movement. 
you might be doing a lot of other things that, that help free software, and I thank you very much for those things, but it's, we can't sugarcoat the fact that that specific thing is hurting the free software movement and hurting you. And if you don't want to stop using it or find that you're in a situation where that's not possible, then I hope that the next step you'll take is to ask yourself uh, what your blocking issues actually are and support free projects that are working to address those areas. Uh, we're hiring. <laughs> if you want to help develop one of those solutions or help provide the infrastructure that will support that, uh, you can see our posting for a GNU Linux Systems Administrator on fsf.org there. But we have to really remember that there are situations in which free software isn't better than the alternative. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't use the free software. It means we should help the free software. And replacing Skype because of that is a high priority project of the Free Software Foundation. But many other projects are also doing great work. Um, and if you can donate to support any of those individual alternatives that I listed before, um, or any others that are promising along the same need, then I hope you'll also address that and consider that. Now, the theme of this event is make it happen, which I think is an excellent theme. Uh, we need to make free software happen, but we also need the corollary that goes along with that. And that corollary is make it stop. Change happens through resistance as well as creation and development. Uh, living free in a non-free world means helping to develop free solutions, um, but it also means saying no to some of the temptations, the tempting things when those solutions don't yet exist. And I know that I'm being critical at the end here, um, and I know it's hard to switch and it can be frustrating, but the situation won't get better unless you help. Free software should be, and, and in the past has been, uh, the best in class when it comes to tools for collaboration and communication. Well, it's really been relatively recently that we've lost that standing, and we won't get it back uh, unless people start refusing the temptation of proprietary software like Skype. So I hope next time someone asks you to Skype or hang out or FaceTime or chat roulette, uh, just please say no um, and explain why. And if it's a really difficult situation in that moment, then at least periodically try the free replacements. If they're not working for you, then take an active participation in reporting why they don't work to the people that are developing them. So at least that way you're helping uh, to offset some of the harm that is happening by helping to move development forward, which will eventually make your life easier and enable you to switch to the free program. And as the GPL says, uh, to protect your rights, we need to prevent others from denying you those rights or asking you to surrender those rights. And part of the reason I chose this topic for this event was because I knew it looked like there was going to be a lot of, uh, of great discussion and talk about how to promote free software, how to encourage people to use it. But we also have to keep in mind this other part, which is that it's not just about using free software alongside proprietary software. It's about helping to create a world where everybody is free, no matter what they're doing with their computer. And uh, well, all I can say is that if you don't agree with us, and if you won't stop, we have ways. <laughs> This is uh, Richard Stallman posing with a katana here that somebody sent to our office uh, after an XKCD comic about defending user freedom. So thank you.